Good afternoon and welcome to our talk with FinOps through the Cloud Cost Jungle. Today we'll talk about how you can achieve transparency in your cloud to optimize cost and usage within the FinOps framework. We will also take you on a little journey through a real jungle, so stick with us. My name is Vivian and I'm here with my lovely colleague Vanessa. We both work at Liquid Reply. I have a background in media informatics and I'm specialized on data analysis and FinOps. With a focus on knowledge sharing because there are still enough people out there who don't know how to save money in the cloud and how to optimize it. I'm Vanessa. I ended up doing FinOps like two years ago and before that I, did, I was a technical project manager and also a cloud consultant. And what I really like about FinOps is that it brings all of those dimensions together. And even more, there is one, one topic I need to talk about, and it's green ops, because that's, I would say, is my new passion. And green ops is all, all about um, optimizing your cloud environment for sustainability. So measuring the carbon footprint and optimizing that one. But I guess that's a topic for another day. So let's start our expedition through the cloud cost jungle. This is our agenda for today. First of all, we will talk about the problem and we will introduce you to FinOps. We will enable you to become your own guide and achieve transparency. And in the end, we will give you an outlook into the future. Okay, let's start with the problem. Why do we even need that FinOps? Previously, pre-cloud, in the old on-prem days, there was a super easy and straightforward process. At least it was easy for the finance people, right? So on the left side here on the slides, you can see an engineering team or a project team. And that team had a demand, maybe a demand for some piece of hardware, let's say a standard on-prem server. Um, and they communicated that demand to their project manager, maybe to the team lead, that's the person in the middle. And that person verified it, um, planned his or her budget accordingly, approved it, and then forwarded it to the procurement department. The person on the right side, the procurement person, um, then purchased a piece of hardware, the server, and yeah, that's it. Pretty straightforward. And six to eight weeks later, a beautiful server arrived, and with it came the invoice. The controlling department or finance department on the right side of the slide, um, they processed the invoice and that was pretty easy because the costs were already planned before and it's just standard capital expenditure. They were able to amortize it, everything is fine. Purchase, done. And the engineering team used the server and usually quickly the server was over or underutilized, hopefully overutilized. And so that started uh, that whole procurement purchasing process all over again. To stay in jungle terms because that's what it's all about today. Um, that old process was all like planting one tree after another. Now the present, the, the cloud days, you see it's a lot more complex than before. Now engineers can buy the resources by the push of a button, but it's not only with one cloud provider, but with all of them. And at the same time, um, it's not only about infrastructure, about servers anymore. Maybe you've heard about PaaS, SaaS, and FAS, <laughs> or whatever else is out there. And so they can buy just whatever cloud resource they want and wish for by the push of a button without waiting for any approval of a team lead, of a project manager, or else. The difficulty with that is that also nobody planned in the budget. So at the end of the month, an invoice, more than one invoice, typically arrives and the controlling department on the right side with the question mark, we're asking themselves, okay, where did that come from? All of these variable costs, we haven't planned them, what's happening? So they're diving deeper into the invoice and quickly they stumble upon a huge amount of data. So you can see like in the, in the back of that slide, that's an AWS curve file, that's short for cost and usage report. And that curve file is a huge CSV full of rows and rows of rows. And each row shows um, the purchasing of one resource in one hour, one um, time unit. And you can imagine that curve file has like a million rows for a short amount of time. And yeah, it's just not human readable anymore. 
And so in the present, what does the finance department do? In the best case, they go back to the engineering people and just ask them. But then the engineering people have to continuously justify them about every single line item of that core file. <coughs> That's annoying, right? I mean, in the worst case, that uh, the finance department wants to go back to the old on-prem processes, meaning they, again, try to get a, that approval process, or maybe they can or are allowed to apply some policies, but that hinders innovation because the engineering people then can't buy those resources super quick anymore. So the time to market is not as fast as it would be with the cloud. And yeah, it's not working well. And at the end of the day, um, also silos start building up. So the people are annoyed of each other, <laughs> obviously. Um, and so they, don't, they stop talking to each other, are angry, and things are not working properly. Yeah. So what can we do about that, Vivi? This is where FinOps comes in to save the day. So what is FinOps exactly? FinOps is a cloud financial management discipline. It's a cultural practice to break down the silos between the different departments. This is the issue Vanessa mentioned before about the current process. FinOps is a combination of DevOps and finance. And FinOps is not something you do alone. So you could see the collaboration between the different departments as the engine for the FinOps practice. The goal here is to get the most value out of the cloud usage with cost and usage optimizations. And if all the stakeholders work together, they can collaborate on data-driven spending decisions and they can leverage all the promised benefits of the public cloud. And this is how the future looks like. First of all, you take all the data of the cloud, so not just the bills or not just the cost and usage report you just saw. You take all the data from all the different cloud providers you use, and then you normalize them, you make them readable and usable. You put them into useful KPIs for all the different stakeholders to work with. And this breaks down the silos. So they start working together, and they can make cloud-based innovation and this whole process contributes to transparency. And transparency is very essential, especially um, to efficiently optimize costs and save costs. And without transparency, people stay confused in their cloud. And with the collaboration, they can manage the cloud cost jungle together. So how to achieve transparency? That's our main topic for the day. And We'll demonstrate that by using a wild tropical jungle. So imagine you're stranded there in that beautiful, some call it the green hell. <laughs> and some of these plants, maybe you, you've stranded there with a few strangers you don't know yet. And of course you need to survive. And so you look at your surroundings, you see all of those plants. Maybe you see some plants that look familiar, others do not. We are not biologists, or I'm not, I'm an IT person. <laughs> Um, but you need to make sense out of this jungle because, I mean, you want to survive now. So what do you do next? How do you start, yeah, just getting familiar with your environment? Well, you guessed it. It starts with transparency and mapping that to the cloud before we come back to our jungle. I'm talking about the account structure. The account structure is the first step in achieving transparency. And accounts themselves are like isolated units. They're like um, units where you can group resources or accounts are also units just like a logical kind of grouping. Um, and when you have an account, it, it's not only beneficial for billing because the invoices at the end of the month are on, on an on-account basis, but it's also beneficial for other things like, for example, security because when one uh, account gets compromised, it doesn't automatically mean the other one is. So there are a few different benefits to that. How to decide your account structure is heavily dependent on your organizational structure. Um, on, on the right side of the slide, you see an example of, the, of a proposed account structure. And that could start with the company on top, then you have like different departments, below that different products, and at the end, you have um, staging for each of the products. 
or in that example, just for product Z. And in that example, the, in, in none of these, so in, in the staging accounts, there are the cloud resources then. So you would see a VM or maybe a EC2 instance if you're working with AWS under one of these dev product Z accounts. But you will probably not encounter one of these cloud resources in any other account because the others are just used for logical yeah, grouping of resources and just as a means um, to make sense of your invoicing at the end of the month. So for the, for the account structure to define that in your company, you really need, again, the involvement of the different stakeholders because the finance people can tell you, okay, what are the cost centers that are relevant? How does the invoicing process work at your company? But you also need um, the business department and, of course, also the engineers. And all together, you can finally define a strategy about your account structure. And going back to our jungle, let's make it easy. Let's divide our jungle into three areas. So maybe on, on the top left, you see some trees. Let's make it super easy and call that the tree area. And then on the right, we have some bushes and plants, let's call it the perennial area. And then on the bottom we have weeds and small plants, let's make it easy and call it a small plants area. So now, stranded in our jungle, we finally kind of know maybe where we are looking around, um, but we still don't know, okay, which of these small plants can I eat or which trees can I use to buy, uh, to, buy <laughs> to build a house. <laughs> um, and so, we need to go one level deeper and make a bit more sense and get a, a few more details in our jungle. And that's um, where we have to talk about tagging. So what is tagging? Tagging is essential to optimize costs. And you do that by assigning useful information to any resource of an account or to an account itself. And this information consists of a key and a value. And this provides an extra layer of granularity for the cost allocation. And in this whole tagging process, of course, you need to involve all the different stakeholders, like we said a thousand times before, and your tagging strategy need to be aligned with your company. And if you look at our example here, you can see that we added another layer. We added the resources. And if you question yourself, okay, when do I need to tag and when do I need to create an extra account for resources? You can see that we have on the right side of our example, we have the database A and the database B. And here we have the tag owner. And if you think about it, you wouldn't create extra accounts for all the different owners that exist because then you would have a lot of different accounts and it would be just too much. Or if you just look at pot A and pot B, here we have the tag team. So we have a front end and a back end team. And you wouldn't tag these services either. Uh, you wouldn't create an extra account for these services either. You would just tag them. Because in the end, you would just know which team is producing which costs of an account. And if we map that back to our jungle, we can see now that um, we added some tags here. We have the tag tree, for example, and with the value rubber tree. We have the tag perennial with the value banana. And we have the usage tag. So we can see now that we can, that we can have some trees for manufacturing, we have trees for food, and we have some plants for medicine. So we know a lot now about our jungle. But there are still some resources that are hard to allocate or that we cannot tag. Here in our example, it would be something like the sun or the water, because we know that all of our plants use water, but we don't know how much. And we need to allocate this to get a full picture of our jungle. And it's the same in the cloud. We have here untaggable resources at all. We have two different kinds. We have the shared costs. These are shared by different teams and used by different teams. For example, network charges, support charges, or shared storage. Then we have public cloud resources that are not taggable at all. These are most of the time special services like the AWS App Mesh. 
there are three different split cost models which help us to allocate these shared costs. First of all, we have the even split. Here, the shared costs are distributed evenly among the different business units. Next, we have the proportional split. Here, it depends on the raw spend of the business unit. So if business unit A has the most raw spend, they will pay the most of the shared costs. And we have the fixed split. This is a fixed percentage, and it's determined by the evaluated past spend. And we go back to our jungle now, and we have here the percentage share of the water consumption. So we added 20% to the small plants area, because there are a lot of weeds and they don't need that much of water. And for the other two parts, we added 40%. So we know a lot of our jungle now. Looks pretty good, right? And I think we can survive now and we can live in our jungle, but we want to evolve with our jungle. We want to know when is the next time we can harvest our plants or how do our grand plants grow and how is our jungle? And we want to live in it. And for that, we need monitoring. And it's the same in the cloud. We need cloud monitoring. Cloud monitoring assesses the elements of the cloud. For example, health checks. And it's not enough to just look at the total costs of the cloud because it's not specific enough and you don't know where to optimize in your cloud. And the account structure and the tagging helps us to know where the costs come from, but there are still a lot of parameters we can monitor. And to know which are the right ones for us, we need individual FinOps KPIs aligned with the companies and the different stakeholders. In our example here, you can see a Grafana dashboard. And for this company, they have KPIs like the CPU cost, the memory cost, the utilization, the requests. So a lot of different things and not just the total costs. And you may ask now, okay, but why do I need a third party tool? Why can I just use my existing cost monitoring tool from AWS, Azure, or GCP? There are two answers. So on the one hand, if you use more than one cloud, um, you can see with a third party tool, you can see all the data from all your different cloud providers in one dashboard together. And on the other hand, if you just use one cloud provider, a third party tool is still good because it helps you with the KPI definition and um, it provides special stakeholder views for you. We brought some monitoring KPIs with us. So these are more technical KPIs, but these are also an insight for the other departments. So first of all, we have the average price of compute for hour, uh, per hour. You want to decrease that number over time, and you can do that through right sizing and reservations. Vanessa will talk about that in a few slides. We have the count of anomalies. Anomalies are something like a spike in your costs, and here it's about the consistent identification of the anomalies and the time it takes to address them. We have the percentage of the tagged resources and of the untagged resources, and we have the percentage of idle resources. And here, listen carefully, here you can achieve the biggest cost savings just by shutting down idle resources. So it's not that hard, just shut down what you don't need. And in our jungle scenario, we have now a beautiful dashboard. So we have the growth rate, we have the count of ripe bananas, and we have the weeds coverage. And in our case, these are the right KPIs for us because we want to survive in the jungle. So these are right. Maybe a biologist would have different KPIs regarding the animals that live in the jungle or other ones. But for us, these are the right ones, and we can survive and live in our jungle. So in a nutshell, Collaboration is key and one of the first steps of FinOps. So re you really need the involvement and maybe even a buy-in from people of finance, of IT teams, um, of business, maybe your C-level people. And you need to create a strategy for all of the topics we mentioned before you start your journey. Speaking of, of accounts and tagging, it's great if you already have that strategy or if, if you've created it but you need to implement it consistently because it doesn't make a lot of sense if, as you, yeah, 
might know if you apply it just once and then forget about it, it's not of great use to you. Same for tagging. And regarding the untaggable costs, um, it really pays off if you revisit the untaggable costs from time to time. So it's awesome if you've decided for one of the cost models, Vivi explained before. But from time to time, the cloud providers have, of course, features. They are working on their products. And so it might make sense to revisit those untaggable costs because some of them might not be untaggable anymore. For example, um, Vivi mentioned the AWS App Mesh. It might be in the future that it's somehow taggable. Fourth point is monitoring. We know, okay, all of us, all of us that work somehow in IT, so I guess all of us are already doing monitoring on a performance level, but we also need that finance monitoring. We engineers are now responsible also for costs, but at the same time, we need to enable the finance people and the business people to work with us to get their buy-in and their understanding of how the cloud works and what they need to consider when they define their user stories or plan the budget. So, we've talked a lot about transparency and we survived in our jungle because it's transparent. And yeah, um, achieving transparency or those concepts that we have, we've explained, those are not rocket science at all. But from our experience, most companies, most people struggle with these topics because usually they work uh, in their, just within their teams. For example, they have great tagging, but just in their project, in their isolated world. Here again, you really need to involve the whole company because FinOps is all about change, about a cultural mindset. Okay, so we've achieved transparency. Now we can finally start optimizing paying and using less for our cloud resources. So the way forward, you see that's us, the green people there with the lantern. The lantern is our transparency. Um, we can now finally start, for example, with processes. There are a few strategies with the cloud where it can save a lot of money. For example, by committing to um, instance types or instance families, it's called commitment-based discounts. You can save up to 60%, but it pays, of course, off if you, before that, know which machine types you really need. Um, you could also work on implementing FinOps in the agile culture or in the agile um, framework of your company. Maybe you're already working in sprints and with user stories, and you might know the definition of done, and so you could add, um, thinking of FinOps, so you could add in the definition of done one sentence about yeah, having the, the costs in mind or making that even a bit stricter. After, or in parallel to the, to the process dimension, you can now really start optimizing and lowering the costs. Usually when companies start out with FinOps, they have about 30% of, well, waste. So you can reduce 30% of your costs as soon as you know where to look, as soon as you have the transparency. Optimizing means, on the one side, shutting down idle resources. Of course, shut down what you don't need. On the other hand, it could mean yeah, right-sizing, so choosing the right instance size for your workload. Typically, it's the lazy way to just use an over-provision and just use a larger instance. And with right-sizing, you reduce that size. You take a look at your monitoring and see, okay, just 5% of the CPU of that machine is being used. I can definitely make that a bit smaller. And the third point that we've mentioned here is auto scaling. So scaling is really one of the benefits of the cloud, but a lot of people don't use the auto scaling functionality at all. And so that's really something you could look into. And then at the end of the road, there is redesigning your applications. So they are architectural patterns, um, like for example, containers or serverless, um, that might reduce your costs even further. But I would say uh, that's really a topic you shouldn't look into right away, except if it's a greenfield project, of course. Um, because, coming back to a not greenfield project, because typically it's a lot of, it takes a, a bit of effort, or a lot of effort to redesign the applications. So that's something you can then 
tackle as soon as you, you've already reduced the cost. And I know that whole jungle metaphor we were talking about, it's super cheesy, but I think it's a great way that you can remember what we were talked about today. The bottom line, FinOps, as it is in the jungle, <laughs> FinOps is a continuously evolving system. FinOps is all about accountability. It's all about um, the engineers that spin up the resources, they need to be accountable. We need to be accountable for the costs um, we, we incur when we deploy a resource. But at the same time, FinOps is about enabling other people and about the mindset change in the company because it doesn't work like in the ancient times with the on-prem times. That old process, that's outdated. So we, don't, we need to look not only at us as engineers and think of costs, but we also have the more or less duty to enable the other departments and explain to finance people why the cloud incurs variable costs, why it's not about capital expenditure anymore. So FinOps really is about yeah, a, a community of people and a cultural mindset change for your whole company. And there is nothing more left to say than go out there, be your own jungle guide and guide others in your company or at home. Thank you. <laughs>